Chapter 41, Moby Dick. I, Ishmael, was one of that crew. My shouts had grown up with the rest. My oath had been welded with theirs. I, and stronger I shouted, and more did I hammer and clench my oath because of the dread in my soul. A wild, mystical, sympathetical feeling was in me. Ahab's quenchless feud seemed mine. With greed, greedy ears, I learned the history of that murderous monster against whom I and all others had taken our oaths of violence and vengeance, revenge. From some time past, through at intervals only, the unaccompanied, secluded white whale had haunted those uncivilized seas, mostly frequented by the sperm whale fishermen. But not all of them knew of his existence. A few of them, comparatively, had knowingly seen him, while the number who has yet had actual, actually and knowingly given battle to him was small indeed. For, owing to the large number of whale cruisers, the disorderly way they were sprinkled over the entire watery circumference, many of them, adventurously, pushing their quest along solitary latitudes, so as seldom or never for a whole 12 month or more on a stretch to encounter a single news telling sail of any sort. The inordinate length of each separate voyage, the Ill irregularity of the times of sailing from home, all these with other circumstances, direct and indirect, long obscured, uh, obstructed the spread through the whole wide, worldwide whaling fleet of the special individualized tidings concerning Moby Dick. It was hardly to be doubted that several vessels reported to have encountered at such or such a time or on such or such a meridian a sperm whale of uncommon magnitude and malignity, which whale, after doing great mischief to have assailants, to his assailants, has completely escaped them. To some minds it was not an unfair presumption, I say, that the whale in question must have been no other than Moby Dick. Yet, as of late, the sperm whale fishery had been marked by various and not unfrequent instances of great ferocity, cunning, and malice in the monster attacked. Therefore, it was that those who by accident ignorantly gave battle to Moby Dick, such hunters perhaps for the most part were content to ascribe the peculiar terror he bred, more as it were, to the perils of the sperm whale fishery at large than the, to the individual cause. In that way, mostly the di disastrous encounter between Ahab and the white whale had here too been popularly regarded. And as for those who, previously hearing of the white whale, by chance caught sight of him, in the beginning of the thing they were every one of them almost as boldly and fearlessly lowered for him as for any other whale of that species. But at length, such calamities did ensue in these assaults not restricted to sprained wrists and ankles, broken limbs, or devoured amputations, but fatal to the last degree of fatality. Those repeated disastrous repulses, all accumulating and piling their terrors upon Moby Dick. Those things had gone far to shake the fortitude of many brave hunters, to, them, to whom the story of the white whale had eventually come. Nor did wild rumors of all sorts fail to exaggerate, and still the more horrify the true histories of these deadly encounters. For not only did fabulous rumors naturally grow out of every body of all surprising terrible events, as the smitted, smitened uh, trees gives birth to its fung fungi, but in maritime life, far more than that of terra firma, wild rumors abound wherever there is adequate reality of them to cling to. And as the sea surpasses the land in this matter, so the whale fishery surpasses every other sort of maritime life. And in the wonderfulness and fearfulness of the rumors which sometimes circulate there, for not only are whalemen as a body unexempt from the, that ignorance and superstitiousness hereditary to all sailors, but of all sailors they are by all odds the most directly brought into contact with whatever is appalling, astonishing in the sea. Face to face, they know, 
they not only eye its greatest marvels, but hand to jaw give battle to them. Alone in such remotest <clears throat> waters, that though you sailed a thousand miles and passed a thousand shores, you would not come to any chiseled hearthstone or aught hospitable beneath that part of the sun in such latitudes and longitudes, uh, pursuing to such a calling as he does. The whaleman is wrapped by inferences of all tending to make his fancy pregnant with many mighty birth. No wonder then that ever gathering volume from mere transit over the wildest watery spaces, the outblown rumors of the white whale did at the end wildest watery, I'm sorry, incorporate with themselves all matter of morbid hints, the half-formed feudal suggestions of supernatural agencies, which eventually invested Moby Dick with a new terrors un unborrowed from anything that visibly appears. So that in, in, the case, in many cases, such a panic did he finally strike that few who, by those rumors at, la, at least, had heard of the white whale, few of those hunters were willing to encounter the perils of his jaw. But, that, but there were still other and more vital practical influences at work, nor even at the present day has the original prestige of the sperm whale, as fearfully distinguished from all other species of the leviathan, did out of the minds of the whalemen as a body. There are those this day among them who, though intelligent and courageous enough to offer in offering battle to the Greenland or the right whale, would perhaps, either from professional in inexperience or incompetency or timidity, decline to contest with the sperm whale. At any rate, there are plenty of whalemen, especially among those whaling nations not sailing under the American flag, who never hostily encountered the sperm whale, but whose sole knowledge of the Leviathan is restricted to the igno ignoble monster primitively pursued in the north. Seated on their hatches, these men will hearken with a childish fireside interest and awe to the wild, strange tales of the southern whaling. Nor is the permanent tremendousness of the great sperm whale anywhere more feelingly comprehended than on board of those prows with stem him. As if the now tested reality of his great had, of his might had in formerly legendary times thrown its shadow before it, we find some great naturalists, Olesen and Povelson, declaring the sperm whale not only to be, the, be a consternation in every other creature in the sea, but also to be so incredi incredibly ferocious as continually to be a thirst for human blood. Not even down to so late a time as Cuvier's were these or almost similar impressions effaced. For in his natural history, the Baron himself affirms that a sight of the sperm whale, all fish, sharks included, are struck with the most lively terrors and often in the precipitancy of their flight dash themselves against the rocks with such violence as to cause instantaneous death. And however the general experience of the fishery may amend such reports as these, yet in their full terribleness, even to the bloodthirsty items of Polvison, the superstitious belief in them is, in some vicissitudes of their vocation, revived in the minds of the hunters. So that, overawed by the rumors and portents concerning him, not a few of the fishermen recalled in reference to Moby Dick the earlier days of the sperm whale fishery, when it was oftentimes hard to induce long-practiced right whalemen to embark in the perils of their new and daring warfare. Such men protesting that although the other leviathans might be hopefully pursued, yet to chase and point lances at such an apparition as the sperm whale was not for mortal men, but that to attempt it would be inevitably to be torn into a quick eternity. On this head, there are some remarkable documents that may be consulted. Nevertheless, some there were who, even in the face of these things, were ready to be give chase to Moby Dick, and a still greater number who, chancing only to hear of him distantly and vaguely, without the specific details of any certain calamity, and without superstitious accompaniments, were sufficiently hardy not to flee from the battle if, if offered. Thank you. Thank you. 
One of the wild suggestings referred to as at last coming to be linked with the white whale in the minds of the superstitiously inclined was the unearthly conceit that Moby Dick was ubiquitous, that he had actually been encountered in opposite latitudes at one and the same instant, ti instant of time. Nor, credulous as such minds must have been, was this conceit altogether without some faint show of superstitious probability. For as the secrets of the currents in the seas have never yet been divulged, even to the most erudite research, so the hidden ways of the sperm whale when beneath the surface remain in great part unaccountable to his pursuers. And from time to time have originated the most curious and contradictory speculations regarding them, especially concerning the mystic modes whereby, after sounding to a great depth, he transports himself with such vast swiftness to the most widely distant points. It is a thing well known to both American and English whale ships, and as well a thing placed upon authoritative record years ago by Scoresby, that some whales have been captured far north in the Pacific, in whose bodies have been found the barbs of harpoons darted in the Greenland seas. Nor is it to be gainsaid that in some of these instances it has been declared that the interval of time between the two assaults could not have exceeded very many days. Hence, by inference, it has been believed by some whalemen that the Norwest Passage, so long a problem to man, was never a problem to the whale. So that here, in the real living experience of living men, the prodigies related in old times of the inland Strello Mountain in Portugal, near whose top there was said to be a lake in which the wrecks of ships floated up to the surface. And that still more wonderful story of the Aruth Aruthsa Fountain near Syracuse, whose waters were believed to have come from the Holy Land by an underground passage. These fabulous narrations are almost fully equaled by the realities of the whale man. Forced into familiarity then with such <coughs> prodigies as these, and knowing that after repeated intrepid assaults, the white whale had escaped alive, it cannot be much matter of surprise that some whalemen should go still further in their superstitions, declaring Moby Dick not only ubiquitous, but immortal, for immortality is but ubiquity in time. And though groves of spears should be planted in his flanks, he would still swim away unharmed. Or if indeed he should ever be made to spout thick blood, such a sight would be but a ghastly deception. For again, in unensanguined billows hundreds of leagues away, his unsullied jet would once more be seen. But even stripped of these supernatural surmisings, there was enough in the earthly make and incontestable character of the monster to strike the imagination with unwanted power. For it was not so much his uncommon bulk that so much distinguished him from, from other sperm whales, but as was elsewhere thrown out, a peculiar snow-white wrinkled forehead and a high pyramidical white hump. These were his prominent features, the tokens whereby, even in the limitless, uncharted seas, he revealed his identity at a long distance to those who knew him. The rest of his body was so streaked and spotted and marbled with the same shrouded hue that in the end he had gained his distinctive appellation of the white whale, a name indeed literally justified by his vivid aspect, when seen gliding at high noon through a dark blue sea, leaving a Milky Way wake of creamy foam, all spangled with golden gleamings. Nor was it his unwanted magnitude, nor his remarkable hue, nor yet his deformed lower jaw that so much invested the whale with natural terror as that unexampled, intelligent malignity which, according to specific accounts, he had over and over again evinced in his assaults. More than all, his treacherous retreats struck more of dismay than perhaps aught else. For when swimming before his exulting pursuers and with every apparent symptom of alarm, he had several times been known to turn round suddenly and bearing down upon them either stave their boats to splinters or drive them back in consternation to their ship. Already several fatalities had attended his chase, but those similar disasters, however little brooded ashore, were by no means unusual in the fishery, yet in most inst instances such seemed the white whale's infernal aforethought of ferocity that every dismembering or death that he caused was not wholly regarded as having been inflicted by an unintelligent agent. Judge then to what pitches of inflamed, distracted fury the minds of his more desperate hunters were impelled, when amid the chips of chewed boats and the sinking limbs of torn comrades, they swam out of the white curds of the whale's direful wrath into the serene, exasperating sunlight 
that smiled on as if at a birth or a bridal. His three boats stove round him, and oars and men both whirling in the eddies. One captain, seizing the line knife from his broken prow, had dashed at the whale, as an Arkansas duelist at his foe, blindly seeking with a six-inch blade to reach the fathom-deep life of the whale. That captain was Ahab. And then it was that suddenly sweeping his sickle-shaped lower jaw beneath him, Moby Dick had reaped away Ahab's leg as a mower a blade of grass in the field. No turbaned Turk, no hired Venetian or Malay could have smote him with more seeming malice. Small reason was there to doubt then that ever since that almost fatal encounter, Ahab had cherished a wild vindictiveness against the whale. All the more fell for that in his frantic morbidness, he at last came to identify with him. Not only all his bodily woes, but all his intellectual and spiritual exasperations. The white whale swam before him as the monomaniac incarnation of all those malicious agencies which some deep men feel eating in them, till they are left living on with <coughs> half a heart and half a lung. That, un, that intangible malignity which has been from the beginning, to whose dominion even the modern Christians ascribe one half of the world's, which the ancient Ophites of the East reverenced in their statue devil. Ahab did not fall down and worship it like them, but deliriously transferring its idea to the abhorred white whale, he pitted himself, all mutilated, against it. All that most maddens and torments, all that stirs up the lees of things, all truth with malice in it, all that cracks the sinews and cakes the brain, all the subtle demonisms of life and thought, all evil to crazy Ahab were visibly personified and made practically assailable in Moby Dick. He piled upon the whale's white hump the sum of all the general rage and hate he felt by his whole race from Adam down. And then, as if his chest had been a mortar, he burst his hot heart's shell upon it. It is not probable that this monomania in him took its instant rise at the precise time of his bodily dismemberment. Then, in darting at the monster, knife in hand, he had been given loose to a sudden passionate corporal animosity, and when he received the stroke that tore him, he probably but felt the agonizing bodily laceration, but nothing more. Yet, when by this collision forced to turn towards home, and for long months, of days and weeks, Ahab and anguish lay stretched together in one hammock, rounding in midwinter that dreary, howling Patagonian cape. Then it was that the, his torn body and gashed soul bled into one another, and so interfusing made him mad. That it was only then, on the homeward voyage after the encounter, that the final monomania seized him seems all but certain from the fact that at intervals during the passage he was, a, he was a raving lunatic and though unlimbed of a leg yet such vital strength yet lurked in his Egyptian chest and was moreover intensified by his delirium that his mates were forced to lace him fast even there as he sailed raving in his hammock. In a straitjacket he swung to the mad rockings of the gales and when running into more sufferable latitudes, the ship, with mild stunned sails, spread, floated acro across the tranquil tropics. And to all appearances, the old man's delirium seemed left behind with him in the Cape Horn swells. And he came forth from his dark den into the blessed light and air. Even then, when he bore that firm collected front, however pale, and issued calm orders once again, and his mates thanked God the dire madfulness was now gone. Even then, Ahab in his hidden self raved on. Human madness is oftentimes a cunning and most feline thing. When you think it fed, it may have but gone and become transfigured into some still subtler form. Ahab's full lunacy subsided not, but deepeningly contracted like the unabated Hudson when that nobleman Northman flows narrowly but unfathomably through the Highland Gorge but as his narrow flowing monomania, not one jot of Ahab's broad madness had left behind, had been left behind. So in that broad madness, not one jot of his great natural intellect had perished. That before living agent now became the living instrument. 
if such a furious trope may may strand may stand, his special lunacy stormed his general sanity and carried it and turned it into concerted cannon upon his own mad mark, so that far from having lost his strength, Ahab to that one end did now possess a thousandfold more potency than ever he had sanely brought to bear upon any one reasonable object. This is much, yet Ahab's larger, darker, deeper part remains unhinted, but vain to popularize profundities, and all truth is profound. Winding far down from within the very spirit of his spiked Hotel de Cluny, where we here stand, however grand and wonderful, now quit it, and take your way, ye nobler, sadder souls, to those vast Roman halls of Thermes, where far beneath the fantastic towers of man's upper earth, his root of grandeur, his whole awful essence, sits in bearded state, an antique buried beneath the antiquities, enthroned on torsos. So with a broken throne, the great gods mocked that captive king. So like caryatid, he, he patient sits, upholding on his frozen brow the piled entablatures of ages. Wind ye down there, ye prouder, sadder souls, question that proud, sad king, a family likeness, ay, he did beget it. Ye young exiled royalties, and from your grim sire only will the old state secret come. Now in his heart, Ahab had some glimpse of this, namely, all by means are sane, my motive and my object mad. Yet without power to kill or change or shun the fact, he likewise knew that to mankind he did long dissemble, in some sort did still. But that thing of this, his dissembling was only subject to his perceptibility, not to his will determinate. Nevertheless, so well did he succeed in that dissembling that when with ivory leg he, strept, he stepped ashore at last, no Nantucketer thought him otherwise than but naturally grieved and that to the quick with the terrible casualty which had overtaken him. The report of his undeniable delirium at sea was like, likewise popularly ascribed to a kindred cause. And so too, all the added moodiness, which always afterwards, to the very day of sailing in the Pequod on the present voyage, sat brooding on his brow. Nor is it so very unlikely that far from distrusting his fitness for another whaling voyage, on account of such dark symptoms, the calculating people of that prudent isle were inclined to harbor the conceit that for those very reasons he was all the better qualified and set on edge for a pursuit so full of rage and wildness as the bloody hunt of whales. Gnawed within and scorched without, with the infixed unrelenting fangs of some incurable idea, such an one could, be, could he be found would seem the very man to dart his iron and lift his lance against the most appalling of all brutes. Or, if for any reason thought to be corporeally incapacitated for that, yet such an one would seem superlatively competent to cheer and howl on his underlings to the attack. But be all this as it may, certain it is, that with the mad secret of his unabated rage bolted up and keyed in him, Ahab had purposely sailed upon the present voyage with the one only and all engrossing object of hunting the white whale. Had any one of his old acquaintances on shore but half dreamed of what was lurking in him then, how soon would their aghast and righteous souls have wrenched the ship from such a fiendish man? They were bent on profitable cruises, the profit to be counted down in dollars from the mint. He was intent on an audacious, immitigable, and supernatural revenge. Here then was this gray-headed, ungodly old man chasing with curses a Job's whale round the world at the head of a crew, too, chiefly made up of mongrel renegades and castaways and cannibals, morally enfeebled also by the incompetence of mere unaided virtue or right-mindedness in Starbuck, the invulnerable jollity of indifference and recklessness in Stubb, and the pervading mediocrity in Flask. Such a crew, so officered, seemed specially picked and packed by some infernal fatality to help him to his monomaniac revenge. 
how it was that they so aboundingly responded to the old man's ire, by what evil magic their souls were possessed, that at times his hate seemed almost theirs, the white whale as much their insufferable foe as his, how all this came to be, what the white whale was to them, or how to their unconscious understandings, also, in some dim, unsuspected way, he might have seemed the gliding great demon of the seas of life. All this to explain would be to dive deeper than Ishmael can go. The subterranean miner that works in us all, how can one tell whither leads his shaft by the ever-shifting, muffled sound of his pick? Who does not feel the irresistible arm drag? What skiff in tow of a 74 can stand still? For one, I gave myself up to the abandonment of the time and the place, but while yet all a rush to encounter the whale could see naught in that brute but the deadliest ill. Chapter 42, The Whiteness of the Whale. What the white whale was to Ahab has been hinted. What at times he was to me as yet remains unsaid. Aside from those more obvious considerations touching Moby Dick, which could not but occasionally awaken in any man's soul some alarm, there was another thought, or rather vague, nameless horror concerning him, which at times by its intensity completely overpowered all the rest, and yet so mystical and well-nigh ineffable was it that I almost despair of putting it in a comprehensible form. It was the whiteness of the whale that above all things appalled me, but how can I hope to explain myself here, and yet, in some dim, random way, explain myself I must, else all these chapters might be naught. Though in many natural objects, whiteness refiningly enhances beauty, as if imparting some special virtue of its own, as in marbles, japonicas, and pearls, and though various nations have in some way recognized a certain royal preeminence in this hue, even the barbaric, grand old kings of Pegu placing the title Lord of the White Elephants above all their other mag magniloquent ascriptions of dominion, and the modern kings of Siam unfurling the same snow-white quadruped in the royal standard, and the Hanoverian flag bearing the one figure of a snow-white charger, and the great Austrian empire, Caesarian heir to the overlording Rome, having for the imperial color the same imperial hue. And though this preeminence in it applies to the human race itself, giving the white man ideal mastership over every dusky tribe, and though beside all this whiteness has been even made significant of gladness, for among the Romans a white stone marked a joyful day, and though in other mortal sympathies and symbolizings, this same hue is made the emblem of many touching, noble things, the innocence of brides, the benignity of age. Though among the red men of America, the giving of the white belt of wampum was the deepest pledge of honor. Though in many climes, whiteness typifies the majesty of justice in the ermine of the judge and contributes to the daily state of kings and queens drawn by milk white steeds. Though even in the higher mysteries of the most august religions, it has been made the symbol of the divine spotlessness and power by the Persian fire worshipers the white forked flame being held the holiest on the altar, and in the Greek mythologies, great Jove himself being made incarnate in a snow-white bull. And though to the noble Iroquois, the midwinter sacrifice of the sacred white dog was by far the holiest festival in their th of their theology, that spotless, faithful creature being held the purest envoy that they could send to the great spirit with the annual tidings of their own fidelity, and though directly from the Latin word for white, all Christian priests would derive the name of one part of their sacred vesture, the alb or tunic, worn beneath the cassock. And though among the holy pomps of the Romish faith, white is especially employed in the celebration of the passion of our Lord. Though in the vision of St. John, white robes are given to the redeemed, and the four and twenty elders stand clothed in white before the great white throne, and the Holy One that sitteth there like white wool. Yet for all these accumulated associations with whatever is sweet and honorable and sublime, there yet lurks an elusive something in the innermost idea of this hue, 
which strikes more of panic to the soul than that redness which affrights in blood. This elusive quality it is which causes the thought of whiteness when divorced from more kindly associations and coupled with any object terrible in itself to heighten that terror to the furthest bounds. Witness the white bear of the poles and the white shark of the tropics. What but their smooth, flaky whiteness makes them the transcendent horrors they are. The ghastly whiteness it is which imparts such an abhorrent mildness even more loathsome than terrific to the dumb gloating of their aspect. So that not the fierce fang tiger in his heraldic coat can so stagger courage as the white shrouded bear or shark. With reference to the polar bear, it may possibly be urged by him who would fain go still deeper into this matter that it is, that it is not the whiteness separately regarded which heightens the intolerable hideousness of that brute for analyze that heightened hideousness, it might be said, only rises from the cir circumstance that the irresponsible ferociousness of the creature stands invested in the fleece of celestial innocence and love, and hence by bringing together two such opposite emotions in our minds, the polar bear frightens us with so unnatural a contrast. But even assuming all this to be true, yet were it not for the whiteness, you would not have that intensified terror. As for the white shark, the white gliding ghostliness of repose in that creature when, up, when beheld in his ordinary moods strangely tallies with the same quality in the polar bear quadrupled. This peculiarity is the most vividly hit by the French in the name they bestow upon that fish. The Romish mass for the dead begins with the requiem eternum, eternal rest, whence requiem den denominating the mass itself and any other funeral music now in allusion to the white, the silent stillness of death in this shark and the mild deadliness of his habits, the French call him Requin. Bethink thee of the albatross, whence come these clouds of spiritual wonderment and pale dread in which that whiteness phantom sails in all imaginations. Not Coleridge first threw that spell, but great God's unflattering laureate nature. Rhyme have had aught to do with those mystic, with mystical impressions which were mine when I saw the bird upon our deck. For neither had I then read the rhyme, nor knew the bird to be an albatross. Yet in saying this, I do but indirectly burnish a little brighter the noble merit of the poem and the poet. Most famous in our Western annals and Indian traditions is that of the white steed of the prairies, a magnificent milk-white charge, large-eyed, small-headed, bluff-chested, and with the dignity of a thousand monarchs in this lofty, overscorning carriage. He was the elected Xerxes of vast herds of wild horses, whose pastures in those days were only fenced by the Rocky Mountains and the Alleghenies. At their flaming head, he westward trooped it like that chosen star, which every evening leads on the hosts of light. The flashing cascade of his mane, the curving comet of his tail, invested him with housings more resplendent than gold and silver beaters could have furnished him a most imperial and angelical apparition of that unfallen Western world, which to the eyes of the old trappers and hunters revived the glories of those primeval times when Adam walked majestic as a god, bluff bowed and fearless as his mighty steed. Whether marching amid his aides and marshals in the van of countless cohorts that endlessly streamed it over the plains, like in Ohio, or whether with his circumvent, circ Conambient subjects browsing all around at the horizon, the white steed gallopingly reviewed them with warm nostrils reddening through his cool milkiness. In whatever aspect he presented himself, always to the bravest Indians, he was the object of trembling reverence and awe. Nor can it be questioned from what stands on legendary record of his noble horse that it was his spiritual whiteness chiefly which so clothed him with divineness and that this divineness had that in it which, though commanding worship at the same time, enforced a certain nameless terror. But there are other instances where this whiteness loses all that accessory and strange glory which invests it in the white steed and albatross. What is it that in the albino man so peculiarly repels and often shocks the eye as that sometimes he is loathed by his own kith and kin? 
It is that whiteness which invests him, a thing expressed by the name he bears. The albino is as well made as other men, has no substantive de deformity, and yet this mere aspect of all pervading whiteness makes him more strangely hideous than the ugliest abortion. Why should this be so? Nor in quite other aspects does nature in her least palpable but not the less malicious agencies fail to enlist among her forces this crowning attribute of the terrible. From its snowy aspect, the gauntleted ghost of the southern seas had been denominated the white squall. Nor in some historic instances has the art of human malice omitted so potent an auxiliary. How wildly it heightens the effect of that passage in Frossart when massed in the snowy symbol of their faction, the desperate white hoods of Ghent murder their bailiff in the marketplace. Nor, in some things, does the common hereditary experience of all mankind fail to bear witness to the supernaturalism of this hue. It cannot well be doubted that the one visible quality in the aspect of the dead which most appalls the gazer is the marble pallor lingering there as if indeed that pallor were as much like the badge of consternation in the other world as of mortal trepidation here. And from the pallor of the dead, we borrow the expressive hue of the shroud in which we wrap them. Nor even in our superstitions do we fail to throw the same snowy mantle round our phantoms, all ghosts rising in the milk-white fog. Yea, while these terrors seize us, let us add that even the king of terrors, when personified by the evangelist, rides on his pallid horse. Therefore, in his other moods, symbolize whatever grand or gracious thing he will by whiteness, no man can deny that in its profound idealized significance it calls up a peculiar apparition to the soul. But though without descent this point be fixed, how is mortal man to account for it? To analyze it would seem impossible. Can we then by the citation of some of those instances wherein the thing of whiteness, though for the time either wholly or in great part stripped of all direct associations calculated to impart to it aught fearful, but nonetheless is found to exert over us the same sorcery, however modified. Can we thus hope to light upon some chance clue to conduct us to the hidden cause we seek? Let us try. But in a matter like this, subtlety appeals to subtlety, and without imagination no man can follow another into these halls. And though, doubtless, some at least of the imagination, uh, imaginative impressions about to be presented may have been shared by most men, yet few perhaps were entirely conscious of them at the time, and therefore may not be able to recall them now. Why to the man of untutored ideality who happens to be but loosely acquainted with the peculiar character of the day does the bare mention of Whitsuntide marshal in the fancy of such long, dreary, speechless processions of slow-pacing pilgrims, downcast and hooden with new-fallen snow? Or to the unread, unsophisticated Protestant of the Middle American states, why does the passing mention of a white friar or a white nun evoke such an eyeless statue in the soul? Or what is there, apart from the traditions of dungeoned warriors and kings, which will not wholly account for it, that makes the White Tower of London tell so much more strongly on the imagination of an untraveled American than those other storied structures, its neighbors, the Byward Tower or even the Bloody, and those sublimer towers, the White Mountains of New Hampshire, whence in peculiar moods comes that gigantic ghostliness over the soul at the bare mention of that name while the thought of Virginia's Blue Ridge is full of a soft, dewy, distant dreaminess? Or why, irrespective of all latitudes and longitudes, does the name of the White Sea exert such a spectralness over the fancy, while that of the Yellow Sea lulls us with mortal thoughts of long, lacquered, mild afternoons on the waves, followed by the gaudiest and yet sleepiness of sunsets? Or, to choose a wholly unsubstantial instance, purely addressed to the fancy, why, in reading the old fairy tales of Central Europe, does the tall, pale man of the heart's forests, whose changeless pallors, whose changeless pallor unrustlingly glides through the green of the groves, why is this phantom more terrible than all the whooping imps of the Blocksburg? 
nor is it altogether the remembrance of her cathedral toppling earthquakes, nor the stampedos of her frantic seas, nor the terrorlessness of arid skies that never rain, nor the sight of her wide field of leaning spires, wrenched cupstones, and crosses all adroop, like canted yards of anchored fleets, and her suburban avenues of house walls lying up over upon each other as a tossed pack of cards. It is not these things alone which make tearless Lima the strangest, saddest city thou canst see. For Lima has taken the white veil, and there is a higher horror in this whiteness of her woe. Old as Pizarro, this whiteness keeps her ruins forever new, admits not the cheerful greenness of complete decay, spreads over her broken ramparts the rigid pallor of an apoplexy that fixes its own distortions. I know that, to the common apprehension, this phenomenon of whiteness is not confessed to be the prime agent in exaggerating the terror of objects otherwise terrible, nor to the unimaginative mind is there aught of terror in those appearances whose awfulness to another mind almost solely consists in this one phenomenon, especially when exhibited under any form at all approaching to muteness or universality. What I mean by these two statements may perhaps be respectively elucidated by the following examples. First, the mariner, when drawing nigh the coasts of foreign lands, if by night he hear the roar of breakers, starts to vigilance, and feels just enough of trepidation to sharpen all his faculties, but under precisely similar circumstances, let him be called from his hammock to view his ship sailing through a midnight sea of milky whiteness, as if from encircling headlands shoals of combed white bears were swimming round him, then he feels a silent, superstitious dread. The shrouded phantom of the whitened waters is horrible to him as a real ghost. In vain, the lead assures him he is still off soundings. Heart and helm, they both go down. He never rests till blue water is under him again. Yet where is the mariner who will tell thee, Sir, it was not so much the fear of striking hidden rocks as the fear of that hideous whiteness that so stirred me. Second, to the native Indian of Peru, the continual sight of the snow-houted Andes conveys naught of dread, except perhaps in the mere fancying of the eternal frosted desolateness reigning at such vast altitudes, and the natural conceit of what a fearfulness it would be to lose oneself in such inhuman solitude. Much the same it is with the backwoodsman of the West, who with comparative indifference views an unbounded prairie sheeted with driven snow, no shadow of tree or twig to break the fixed trance of whiteness. Not so the sailor, beholding the scenery of the Antarctic, Antarctic seas, where at times, by some infernal trick of leisure de main in the powers of frost and air, he shivering and half shipwrecked, instead of rainbows speaking hope and solace to his misery, views what seems a boundless churchyard grinning upon him with its lean ice monuments and splintered crosses. But thou sayest, methinks this white lead chapter about whiteness is but a white flag hung out from a craven soul. Thou surrenderest to a hypo, Ishmael. Tell me, why this strong young colt, fold in some peaceful valley of Vermont, far removed from all beasts of prey, why is it that upon the sunniest day, if you but shake a fresh buffalo robe behind him so that he cannot even see it, but only smells its wild animal muskiness, why will he start, snort, and with bursting eyes paw the ground in frenzies of affright? There is no remembrance in him of any gorings of wild creatures in his green northern home, so that the strange muskiness he smells cannot recall to him anything associated with the experience of former perils. For what knows he, this New England colt, of the black bisons of distant Oregon? No. But here thou beholdest, even in a dumb brute, the instinct of the knowledge of the demonism in the world. Though thousands of miles from Oregon, still when he smells that savage musk, the rending, goring bison herds are as present as to the deserted wild foal of the prairies, which this instant they may be trampling into dust. Dakara, you have no mino, tonaki, toyo, koza no hana, no, Tonihara tatsu, hanemi, arasini, 
嵐に含まくられて大草原に埋めり積もった雪の作爆たる変月草こうしたものはすべてイシュメールにとって若干を怯えさせるあの野牛の生皮の一振りのようなものなのだ神秘的な美行がこのように暗示している名城しがたいものがどこにあるのか知る由もないが困ず若駒の場合と等しく私の場合もそのようなものがどこかに存在するに違いないのだこの歌詞会はその多くの様相からして愛によって作られているように思われるが不可思議会は恐怖によって作られ,作られたのだしかしまだ私らはこの白さの序文を解き明かし,していずそれがどうしてあれほどの力で魂に訴えかけるものかも分かっていないしかももっとキーでもっと驚く,驚くべきことは今まで見てきた通りこの城は霊的なジブスの,もの最も意味深い象徴いやキリスト教の神聖のベールそのものであると常時にしかも人間の身体をもっと寒,寒からしめるジブスにあってその恐怖を強める力になっているのだ銀河の白い深みを見つめるとき絶対の思いに背筋が続々寒くなるのはあの白さがその呆然さで夢中の無慈悲な虚無と無限を無数実験させるからだろうかまた本質において白は色というよりも色のないのが見えることであり同時に全ての色の結集したものであるのでそうした理由で公然たる雪景色にだけあのような意味に満ちた赤白たる空白私らの恐れ進む無色にして金色なる無心の思想があるのだろうか私たちが自然科学者の他の教説つまらぬ他の全ての地上の色彩草原なまたは優美なるあらゆる装飾遊泳の空と森の甘美な色合いしかり蝶のきらびやかなドバードバーク少女の蝶のような法こうしたものは全て巧妙な欺瞞に過ぎず自物に本来飾って本来揃っているのではなく単に外から付け加えられたものでありしたがって進化された自然そのものも売夫婦さながに化粧の塊でその誘惑物でうちなるか老言堂を隠しているに過ぎるというあの教説をあの教説を考えさらに進んで自然のあ,るあらゆる色彩を生み出す神秘的な化粧のもとである光という偉大な原色は原力はそれ時代では永遠に白または無色のままであってもし媒介物なしに事実に働きかけるならばそれはあらゆるものトゥーレップやバラサイも分,分身の旧白の光に染めるだろうと考えればこうした全てを思い巡らせばその宇宙はすっかりましし物を一色に見せる色目眼鏡をかけるのを好む拒むラブ,サラブランドの表情な旅人たちのように惨めにもそうした配信者は自身の周りの全視野を包む永遠の白の芯を見つめて目くらになってしまうのだそしてあの白子会はあの白子クジラはこうした全ての事柄の象徴であったしてみればあの強烈な追跡も不可,不可思議ではあるまい。Thus, then, the muffled rollings of the Milky Sea, the bleak rustlings of the festooned frosts of mountains, the desolate shiftings of the windrowed snows of prairies, all these to Ishmael are as the shaking of that buffalo robe to the frightened colt. The winter neither knows where lie the nameless things of which the mystic sign gives forth such hints, yet with me, as with the colt, somewhere those things must exist. 
though in many ways of its aspects, this visible, visible world seems formed in love, the invisible spheres were formed in fright. But not yet have we solved the incantation of this whiteness and learned why it appeals with such power to the soul. And the more strange and far more pretentious, why, as we have seen, is it at once the most meaning symbol of the spiritual things, nay, the very veil of the Christian's deity, and yet should be as it is, the intensifying agent in things the most appalling to mankind? Is it that by its indefiniteness, it shadows forth the heartless voids and immensities of the universe, and thus stabs us from behind with the thought of annihilation when beholding the white depths of the Milky Way? Or is it that as in essence, whiteness is not so much a color as the visible absence of color, and at the same time, the concrete of all colors? Is it for those reasons that there is such a dumb blankness, full of meaning in a wide landscape of snows, a colorless, all color of atheism from which we shrink? And when we consider that the other theory of the natural philosophers, that all other earthly hues, every stately or lovely emblazoning, the sweet tinges of sunset skies and woods, yea, and the gilded velvets of butterflies and the butterfly cheeks of young girls, all these are but subtle deceits, not actually inherent in substances, but only laid on from without so that all deified nature absolutely paints like the harlot whose lurements cover nothing but the charnel house within. And when we proceed further and consider the mystical cosmetic which produces every one of her hues, the great principle of light forever remains white or colorless in itself. And if operating without medium upon matter would touch all objects, even tulips and roses with its own blank tinge. Pondering all this, the palsied universe lies before us a leper. And like willful travelers in Lapland who refuse to wear colored and coloring glasses upon their eyes, so the wretched infidel gazes himself blind at the monumental white shroud that wraps all the prospect around him. And of all these things, the albino whale was the symbol. Wonder ye then, then, at the fiery hunt. Chapter 43, hark, Hist. did you hear that noise, um, Kabako? It was the middle watch, a fair moonlight. The seamen were standing in cordon, extending one from the freshwater butts in the waist to the scuttlebutt near the taffrail. In this manner, they passed the buckets to fill the scuttlebutt, standing for the most part on the hallowed precincts of the quarter deck. They were careful not to speak or rustle their feet. From hand to hand, the buckets went in the deepest silence, only broken by the occasional flap of a sail and the steady hum of the unceasingly advancing keel. It was in the midst of this repose that Archie, one of the cordon, whose post was near the after hatches, whispered to his neighbor, a cholo, the words above, Shh, did you hear that noise, Kabako? Take the bucket, will you, Archie? What noise do you mean? There it is again, under the hatches. Don't you hear it? A cough? It sounded like a cough. Cough be damned. Pass along the return bucket. There again. There it is. It sounds like two or three sleepers turning over now. Caramba, have done, shipmate, will ye? It's the three soaked biscuits ye eat for supper turning over inside of you. Nothing else. Look to the bucket. Say what you will, shipmate. I've sharp ears. Ah, uh, you are the chap, ain't ye? I heard the hum of the old Quakeress's knitting needles 50 miles at sea from Nantucket. You're the chap. Grin away. We'll see what turns up. Hark ye, Kabako. There is somebody down in the afterhold that has not yet been seen on deck. And I suspect our old mogul knows something of it, too. I heard Starbuck tell Flask one morning watch that there was something of that sort in the wind. Shh, the bucket. Thank you. Chapter 44, The Chart. Had you followed Captain Ahab down into his cabin after the squall that took place on the night succeeding that wild ratification of his purpose with his crew, you would have seen him go to a locker in the transom 
and bringing out a large wrinkled roll of yellowish sea charts, spread them before him on his screwed down table. Then seating himself before it, you would have seen him intently study the various lines and shadings which there met his eye. And with slow but steady pencil, trace additional courses over spaces that before were blank. At intervals, he would refer to piles of old logbooks beside him, wherein were set down the seasons and places in which, on various former voyages of various ships, sperm whales had been captured or seen. While thus employed, the heavy pewter lamp suspended in chains over his head continually rocked with the motion of the ship, and forever through shifting gleams and shadows of lines upon his wrinkled brow, till it almost seemed that while he himself was marking out lines and courses on the wrinkled charts, some invisible pencil was also tracing lines and courses upon the deeply marked chart of his forehead. But it was not this night in particular that in the solitude of his cabin, Ayyub thus pondered over his charts. Almost every night they were brought out. Almost every night some pencil marks were effaced and others were substituted. For with the charts of all four oceans before him, Ahab was threading a maze of currents and eddies with a view to the more certain accomplishment of that monomaniac thought of his soul. Now to anyone not fully acquainted with the ways of the Leviathan, it might seem so ab an absurdly hopeless task thus to seek out one solitary creature in the unhooped oceans of this planet. But not so did it seem to Ahab, who knew the sets of all rides and currents, and thereby calculating the driftings of the sperm a whale's food, and also calling to mind the regular ascertained seasons for hunting him in particular latitudes could arrive at reasonable surmises, almost approaching to certainties, concerning the timeliest day to be upon this or that ground in search of his prey. So assured, indeed, is the fact concerning the periodicalness of the sperm whales resorting to given waters, that many hunters believe that, could he be closely observed and studied throughout the world, were the logs for one voyage of the entire whale fleet carefully collated, then the migrations of the sperm whale would be found to correspond in invariability to those of the herring shoals or the flights of swallows. On this hint, attempts have been made to construct elaborate migratory charts of the sperm whale. Besides, when making a passage from one feeding ground to another, the sperm whales guided by some infallible instinct, say rather secret intelligence from the deity, mostly swim in veins, as they are called, continuing their way along a given ocean line with such undeviating exactitude that no ship ever sailed to her course by any chart with one tithe of such marvelous precision. Though in these cases, the direction taken by any one whale be straight as a surveyor's parallel, and though the line of advance be strictly confined to its own unavoidable straight wake, Yet the arbitrary vein in which at these times he is said to swim generally embraces some few miles in width, more or less as a vein is presumed to expand or contract, but never exceeds the visual sweep from the whale ship's mastheads when circumspectly gliding along this magic zone. The sum is that at particular seasons within that breadth and along that path, migrating whales may with great confidence be looked for and hence, not only at substantiated times, upon well-known separate feeding grounds, could Ahab hope to encounter his prey, but in crossing the widest expanses of water between those grounds, he could, by his art, so place and time himself on his way, as even then not to be wholly without prospect of a meeting. There was a circumstance which at first sight seemed to entangle his delirious but still methodical scheme but not so in the reality, perhaps. Though the gregarious sperm whales have their regular seasons for particular grounds, yet in general, you cannot conclude that the herds which haunted such and such a latitude or longitude this year, say, will turn out to be identically the same with those that were found there the preceding season. 
though there are peculiar and unquestionable instances where the contrary of this has proved true. In general, the same remark, only within a less wide limit, applies to the solitaries and hermits among the matured aged sperm whales. So that though Moby Dick had in a former year been seen, for example, on what is called the Seychelles ground in the Indian Ocean, or Volcano Bay on the Japanese coast, yet it did not follow that were the Pequod to visit either of those spots at any subsequent corresponding season, she would infallibly encounter him there. So too with some other feeding grounds where he had at times revealed himself. But all these seemed only his casual stopping places and ocean in, so to speak, not his places of prolonged abode. And where Ahab's chances of accomplishing his object have hitherto been spoken of, allusion has only been made to whatever wayside and, and, teeth and tethodent extra prospects were his, ere a particular set time or place were attained, when all possibilities would become probabilities, and, as Ahab fondly thought, every possibility of the next thing to a certainty. That particular set time and place were conjoined in the one technical phrase, the season on the line. For there and then, for several consecutive years, Moby Dick had been periodically described lingering in those waters for a while, as the sun in its annual round loiters for a predicted interval in any one sign of the zodiac. There it was, too, that most of the deadly encounters with the white whale had taken place. There the waves were storied with his deeds. There also was that tragic spot where the monomaniac old man had found the awful motive to his vengeance. But in the cautious comprehensiveness and unloitering vigilance with which Ahab threw his brooding soul into this unfaltering hunt, he would not permit himself to rest all his hopes upon the one crowning fact above mentioned. However, flattering it might be to those hopes, nor in the sleeplessness of his vow could he so tranquilize his unquiet heart as to postpone all intervening quests. Now the Pequod had sailed from Nantucket at the very beginning of the season on the line. No possible endeavor then could enable her commander to make the great passage southwards, double Cape Horn, and then running down 60 degrees of latitude, arrive in the equatorial Pacific in time to cruise there. Therefore, he must wait for the next ensuing season. Yet the premature hour of the Pequod sailing had perhaps been correctly selected by Ahab with a view to this very complexion of things, because an interval of 365 days and nights was before him, an interval which, instead of imperiently enduring ashore, he would spend in a miscellaneous hunt, if by chance the white whale, spending his vacation in seas far remote from his periodical feeding grounds, should turn up his wrinkled brow off the Persian Gulf, or in the Bengal Bay, or China Seas, or in any other waters haunted by his race. So that monsoons, pampas, nor'westers, harmatons, trades, any wind but the Levantar and Simum, might blow Moby Dick into the devious zigzag world circle of the Pequod circumnavigating wake. But granting all this yet, regarding, uh, regarded discreetly and coolly, seems it not but a mad idea of this, that in the broad, boundless ocean, one solitary whale, even if encountered, should be thought capable of individual recognition from his hunter, even as a white-bearded mufti in the thronged thoroughfares of Constantinople? Yes for the peculiar snow-white brow of Moby Dick and his snow-white hump could not but be unmistakable. And have I not tallied the whale? Ahab would mutter to himself, as after poring over his charts till long after midnight, he would throw himself back in reveries, tallied him, and shall he escape? His broad fins are bored and scalloped out like a lost sheep's ear, and here his mad mind would run on in a breathless race till a weariness and faintness of pondering came over him. And in the open air of the deck, he would seek to recover his strength. Ah, God, what trances of torments does that man endure who is consumed with one unachieved revengeful desire? He sleeps with clenched hands and wakes with his own bloody nails in his palms. 
Often, when forced from his hammock by exhausting and intolerably vivid dreams of the night, which resuming his own intense thoughts through the day, carried them on amid a clashing of frenzies and whirled them round and round in his blazing brain till the very throbbing of his life spot became insufferable anguish. And when, as was sometimes the case, these spiritual throes in him heaved his being up from its base and a chasm seemed opening in him from which forked flames and lightnings shot up and accursed fiends beckoned him to leap down among them. When this hell in himself yawned beneath him, a wild cry would be heard through the ship and with glaring eyes Ahab would burst from his stateroom as though escaping from a bed that was on fire. Yet these, perhaps, instead of being the unsuppressible symptoms of some latent weakness or fright at his own resolve, were but the plainest tokens of its intensity. For, at such times, crazy Ahab, the scheming, unappeasedly steadfast hunter of the white whale, this Ahab that had gone to his hammock was not the agent that so caused him to burst from it in horror again. The latter was the eternal living principle or soul in him, and in sleep, being for the time dissociated from the characterizing mind, which at other times employed it for its outer vehicle or agent, it spontaneously sought escape from the scorching contiguity of the frantic thing, of which, for the time, it was no longer an integral. But as the mind does not exist unless leagued with the soul, therefore it must have been that in Ahab's case, yielding up all his thoughts and fancies to his one supreme purpose, that purpose, by its own sheer inveteracy of will, forced itself against gods and devils into a kind of self-assumed, independent being of its own. Nay, could grimly live and burn while the common vitality to which it was conjoined fled horror-stricken from the unbidden and unfathered birth. Therefore, the tormented spirit that glared out of bodily eyes when what seemed Ahab rushed from his room was for the time but a vacated thing, a formless somnambulistic being, a ray of living light, to be sure, but without an object to color, and therefore blankness in itself. God help the old man, thy thoughts have created a creature in thee, and he whose intense thinking thus makes him a Prometheus, a vulture feeds upon that heart forever, that vulture, the very creature he creates.